Why don't I start with an introduction? So my name is Dara Roth Edney. I'm a social worker and a psychotherapist, and I have a group counseling practice called Inform Fertility that's working entirely in the area of reproduction. I personally went through IVF six times, and eventually I had my children with surrogacy. Uh, and my associate, Blair, was a surrogate herself. And so together we offer counseling supports to people who are struggling with infertility, struggling with loss, and dealing with all the various emotions that come along with reproductive loss, with infertility, and also with people who are working with third parties. So surrogacy, egg donation, sperm donation, embryo donation. Uh, so the idea for this evening is the hardest for people when they're going through infertility, stay connected to the people that they love and protect their hearts, which are so vulnerable during this really, really difficult time. So I'm here to answer your questions, and I see that we already have one in the Q&A, so let's get going. Housekeeping things, um, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I don't forget anything. This is being recorded, and the recording is going to be available on the TRIO website. Anybody who's in attendance tonight will get an email from TRIO. If you would like a copy of this recording, it can be available on the website to have for yourself or to send along to somebody that you want. I'm going to go to the questions now. So the first question, great one. Should I invite friends I know are trying to my kid's birthday party or to baby showers? That is a really, really great question. The answer to that is always, it depends. Most of my clients are really heartbroken when they're left out of things. And they are very, very heartbroken when there is, isn't an understanding about why they may not be able to attend. If you know that you're going to be putting together a birthday party for your child, let you know. We would love it if you were there, but there's no pressure at all. You can even decide last minute, um, but you're officially invited and you could let me know if you would like me to send you an official invitation or if this is enough, um, because I understand if you're not able to come. And that's the same thing with the baby showers. Baby showers are incredibly difficult, sometimes even more so than children's birthday parties, because they often tend to be gendered events. And so if it's a lot of women who are pregnant themselves, who've had children or who are going to be having children, most of the discussion at baby showers tends to be about that. Incredibly painful for people who are trying or have had recent losses. Um, so always a good thing to check in with somebody, let them know that you love them, um, that you completely understand if they can't come, but you want them to know that if they're able to, even if they only do a quick drop in, that they're welcome to come. And just leaving that door open for what feels comfortable to them is a really beautiful way of doing it. The next question is, my husband and I want to support our kids going through this financially, but don't know how to bring it up. For anybody who's able to do that, it's an incredible thing to do. Uh, fertility treatments, as I'm sure lots of you know, are unbelievably expensive. And for a lot of people, it adds to the stress of doing fertility because they know that they're putting money into something that may or may not bring fruition. And that adds to the distress that's involved. Um, so financially, if you're in a position to help, it's amazing. Depending on the relationship that you have with your kids, it's something that you can just offer. You can just say, you know, I I wish that there was something more that we could do to be able to be helpful to you. We know that this is so difficult what you're going through. We want to be able to support you any way we can. Please know if there are logistical, practical things that we can do to support you. We want to do that financially if we can be helpful. We have some money aside that we would love to be able to give to you. Um, sometimes people find it helpful to name a number uh, because that can also help with planning. So let's say you're able to help them with $2,000, $10,000, a whole IVF cycle, um, being able to offer something concrete. Um, we would really love the opportunity to be able to cover an IVF cycle for you if that's something that you want. Um, please know that that money is here for you. If at any point you think that that would be helpful, no strings attached, please let us know. Um, so being able to just outwardly just say it and also put a number or a thing on it, right? Like that IVF cycle or to help contribute X amount of dollars to egg donation or sperm donation or whatever it is that you're comfortable with. And that way it's not an offer that's coming to them without them kind of knowing what that means and then having to come back to you and say like, well, how much? Um, so that would, I think, be a really great way of doing it. Another question. I never know whether to ask my son or daughter-in-law. I want her to know I care, but I feel awkward asking her. I'm assuming that question might mean, do you mean you want to ask them? Maybe if you can just put in the chat in the question, the person who asked that question, are you asking you, you never know whether to ask them how they're doing, or you never know how to ask them where they are in their treatment? 
Uh, if you could be a bit more specific with that question, that would be really helpful. And then this one, I don't know if it's the same person. I never know if I should bring it up or let my friend know I care or just not ask because it's painful to talk about. The truth is, is that there's, what makes this so difficult is that there isn't really a right answer. One of the things that is unbelievably painful about this is feeling like people aren't thinking about something that is taking up so much bandwidth in your brain. And it's also painful to be put into a corner where you're having to talk about something that you don't want to talk about. You can assume that for the most part, people who are going through ongoing infertility and reproductive loss are thinking about this almost all of the time. So this is not likely to be a scenario where somebody's not thinking about it and you're just catching them in that moment where they're not thinking about it, but you may be catching them when they don't want to talk about it. So a good way of saying it is really just to say that, like, hey, I, I don't want to pressure you and ask questions, but just wanted to let you know that I'm here. I'm thinking about you. Please let me know if you'd like to talk. Or if you know that something happened, for example, let's say you know that they went into the clinic for testing or you know that they got results um, or you know that it's the anniversary of a miscarriage or a stillbirth or um, they just got other news that was difficult. Instead of asking them how they're doing, you can ask them if they'd like to talk about how they're doing. Right. You could say, I know that this was a really tough week for you at the fertility clinic. Um, I'm here for you. Do you want to do you want to talk about how you're doing or should we talk about something else? So that way they're in the position where they can talk if they want to, but they don't feel like they're having to answer a specific question. So that's always a great way of doing it is just asking them if they want to talk. I understand all the lingo and want to understand more. What exactly is IVF? And really terrific that um, you're understanding some of the lingo. Uh, it's really difficult to feel like you're going through something really invasive and personal and difficult and that you're constantly having to educate people around it. So if you have a loved one who's going through IVF, uh, and I'm going to answer some questions now, uh, but definitely doing your own research. There's a ton of stuff out there uh, in terms of what fertility treatments are. So that's not to suggest that you could never ask a question. Of course, that's part of a dialogue and that's part of an ongoing conversation with somebody that you love. But if you can take it on yourself to learn those things, it's incredibly it's a really loving, loving thing to do, to be able to, if if a loved one is talking to you about something, um, to be able to say, yes, I actually looked that up and I, I understand what PGT is. Um, for them to know that you took the time yourself out of your own time to do that research so that they didn't have to explain it to you is an incredibly beautiful thing to do. IVF stands for in vitro fertilization, and it's when eggs and sperm are taken and put together in the lab to create an embryo. So as part of IVF, the length, some of the terms you may hear, you may hear the term ICSI, which is I-C-S-I. -I. Um, ICSI is when the embryologist will take the sperm, a specific sperm that's been chosen based on the quality of it and manually inject it into an individual egg, as opposed to IVF, which happens in the Petri dish where the sperm naturally on their own are fertilizing the eggs. Whether it's IVF or NICSI, the result hopefully is an embryo. And so the first part of IVF is getting the eggs, getting the sperm, and the fertility lab is putting them together. The second part of it is when somebody undergoes an embryo transfer, where that embryo is transferred back into a uterus or into a new uterus. And as part of IVF, a huge amount of drugs are necessary because the idea is instead of one egg ovulating, which is typical for a person with eggs, that they're ovulating one egg a month, the goal is that numerous eggs are, are being taken out. And so the hope with IVF is that the medication is increasing the follicle count each egg is inside of a follicle. So the goal is that that is increasing throughout the time period that somebody is on medication. They're being monitored really carefully. So one of the difficult things about IVF is that people have to go back to the clinic often throughout this process. Sometimes people think IVF is you take some drugs at home and then you go into the clinic for your egg retrieval without understanding that IVF is weeks and for some people months of preparatory work where they're taking drugs, where they're going into the clinic for weeks, um, doing transvaginal ultrasounds and full bladder pelvic ultrasounds 
ultrasounds and blood work. And they're being monitored really, really carefully to see how they're doing on the medication to make sure it's appropriate what they're doing and that they're not, that they're safe throughout this and that they're going to have enough eggs to make it worthwhile to do the egg retrieval. So it's a very invasive, it could be quite a lengthy process. And people are giving themselves medication through injections to grow those eggs. So they're at the stage where they can be retrieved through a procedure that's done at the clinic. And then as I described, the magic that happens in the lab, the science magic that happens in the lab, where the egg and the sperm are brought together to create that embryo. The second part of that IVF leading up to the transfer is when those embryos are growing in the lab. And typically they're growing up to five days and they're turning into something called blastocysts. And that is hopefully what's being transferred back into an embryo. I hope that answers the question. Just some of the basics about what IVF is. I want to offer emotional support to my loved one, but I'm unsure of what to say or how to express my empathy. Are there any phrases or gestures that might be particularly comforting? One of the things that I used to find incredibly difficult and frustrating is when people would say to me, trying to be empathetic, and they would say to me, I can't even imagine how hard this would be. And it would make me feel like, really, you can't, you can't imagine it all? And it made me feel actually much more alone. It would have been really helpful for somebody to say, I can only imagine how difficult this must be. I know how much you want a baby. So, so putting it into some context, so it feels like their emotions are normalized, reminding them of the ways in which they've gotten through hard things before. Something that is not helpful is what's called toxic positivity. There's a lot of stuff that happens with fertility treatment that's successful. And there's a lot of treatment options that really do incredible things for people's opportunity to have children. But as with anything else in medicine, there is nothing that is 100%. So when people say, I just know this cycle is going to work, it's actually rarely helpful because you don't know that. You can't know that. None of us can know that. There's something about telling somebody that they just have to think positively, that you know it's going to work, that they should never give up. It's meant to be loving and helpful, but actually often it's not received that way because we don't know that it's going to work because people cannot help if sometimes they feel sad or afraid or worried or scared. After somebody has had three miscarriages, it is completely normal to be afraid and worried that they would have another one. If somebody has done IVF treatments that haven't worked and they're doing their second or third or fourth IVF, it's completely natural for them to be thinking it may not work. So being told that they have to think positively may not be possible for them. And it ends up making people feel like it's their fault that it's not successful. Helpful things to say would be, you are really strong. I've seen you get through hard things before. I know you can get through this. You're not alone. Saying to somebody, I know that you can get through this, but don't feel like you have to get through it and be strong every minute. It's okay to cry. This is really hard. You're going through something really difficult. I see that. I'm here for you. So anything that you can say that is acknowledging and validating their fears. So if somebody says, I'm really scared that my embryo transfer isn't going to work, instead of saying to them, don't think like that, you could say to them, that must be so scary to have put so much into this and be so afraid that the transfer won't work. Like that must be really scary. I remember though, that you told me that you're with a really good clinic. And I remember that you talked about really trusting your doctor. Didn't you also tell me that they transferred a really good quality embryo? it sounds like there are some things to be hopeful about even while you're still afraid, right? So there's an opportunity there to validate, acknowledge the things that they're afraid about, which are real things, which could possibly happen. And then also remind them of the things that are also true. Some of the, some of the positive, hopeful things that are true. The goal is not to be giving people platitudes and not to be saying things that you have no way of knowing if they're true or not. So those are really, really helpful things. In terms of gestures that could be really comforting, if the person that you love is open with you about their timelines, then treating it not like they're sick because they're not sick, but the kinds of things that you would do if somebody was sick. So for example, if somebody you know and love is really sick, you might drop off a meal. You might offer to walk their dog. Um, you might offer to get some groceries for them. 
When people are going through IVF, time is really tight. They're often at the clinic incredibly early at the morning. Um, they're waking up early for injections. Um, often people are working full time during this. A lot of the fertility drugs make people who are taking them really tired and headachy and not feeling great. And to know that you're coming home to a home cooked meal that somebody you love has dropped off can be really lovely. Uh, if you have to go to the clinic and get really good groceries that are healthy and easy to cook with, those kinds of things can be really, really loving gestures that are really concrete. Here's another question. I want to be there for my loved one during their appointments, but I'm not sure if they would prefer to go alone or have somebody accompany them. Great question. Um, I would say ask, but ask with a concrete offer. That puts the onus on the person to come up with those things themselves. It's great to be able to offer something concrete. I would love to be able to accompany you to appointments if you would like me to. I can do that on any Thursday or Tuesday. Uh, and just let me know if you'd like me to. I can drive you or I can wait downstairs at the coffee shop or I can come upstairs with you. So you just let me know if any of those things would be nice. And if none of those things are okay for you, that's okay too. I totally am good with you going alone. I just want you to know I'm here for you. So you're offering something very, very concrete. The other thing for any of you who are not able to go, oftentimes, whether it's work or distance, you're just not able to accompany somebody that you love to an appointment, but you really wish that you could. Um, you can ask them if it would be helpful for you to be available by text. Uh, sometimes people are waiting in waiting rooms for a really long time, and that can feel really lonely and scary. And so if they know that they have somebody that they love on the opposite end of a phone where they can text them, um, or if you have some kind of game that you're playing together, uh, some kind of word game or, uh, I don't know, some, you, you could have some kind of app on your phone where you have a shared game, um, words for friends or any of those things. Sometimes that can be really nice too. It's just a way of your, the person that you love is sitting there in a waiting room and you're with them virtually playing a game to distract them um, or just texting with them back and forth so that they know that you're there and that you're thinking of them. Okay, so we're waiting to see if there's any more questions right now. I wanted to go back as we're waiting for those questions to that idea of toxic positivity and really encourage everybody to really think about that. If there's a one big takeaway, I would say that that's a really huge one. Um, it's the message that a lot of people get, especially women uh, who are told over and over again that they just have to be positive and that they shouldn't give up. Uh, and that is a lot of pressure on people. And it ends up making people really feel like the reason things aren't working are because of some Something they did. So being able to find something that is authentic and true that you can tell them, something that is hopeful, but real. Uh, and that goes back to that idea of reminding them of their strengths. If they have a really a good relationship with their partner, reminding them that they're not alone, that they've got their partner, that they have you. If you've heard them talk about the clinic and how much they like the clinic, reminding them about that, um, reminding them of other hard things that they've gotten through. So those are all the things that can be really, really wonderful. The other thing I think I would say is asking people how they're doing. It sounded like there's some of you wanting to ask people, how are you doing, but not quite sure how. So one of the things that you can do is be a bit more specific with that question. So the difference between how are you doing, where if somebody is dealing with a loss or going through IVF, how they're doing may not be very good overall. It could feel like you're unaware or somehow oblivious or minimizing what they're going through. But it's also true that when people go through hard things, the level of hard is not the same every day and that there are days that can be better than other days. So a question you can ask is, how are you doing today? I know last week was really, really rough for you. How are you doing today? And that gives somebody the space to be able to say, actually, today was okay. Or to say, actually, today is an especially hard day. And it doesn't create a scenario where they feel like they have to remind you of all the hard things they're going through because overall they're not okay. Um, so you're bringing it just down to that specific. How are you doing today? That can be really helpful. Seeing if there are any other questions that are coming up. We do have a couple more minutes. One of the big things that people find difficult as they're going through fertility treatments is feeling like their feelings aren't normalized. So another thing I can offer is anything that you can do to normalize those feelings. Um, people that you love that are going through fertility struggles may find it difficult to be happy for other people around them who are having children. Uh, so if they say something like that, or if they intimate something like that, for you to show that you understand that. 
it can be very, very difficult in families when some adult children are having children and some are struggling. And especially as parents, as grandparents, to feel like you're caught between those two things, the adult child that you love who has kids and that you're a grandparent and you're so excited and happy or that are pregnant and another grown child that you have that's struggling. So one of the things that I can also offer you is finding times to get together separately. Um, Everybody deserves to have pregnancies celebrated. And as parents, as grandparents, you deserve to be able to celebrate and relish in pregnancies and in grandchildren. If you have a child, a grown child who's struggling, seeing their parent ooh and ah over a sibling's pregnancy or children can be incredibly painful. So sometimes creating opportunities to see people alone so you can give attention to the person who is pregnant or who is having a child who has children without feeling like you have to walk on eggshells or be careful with your wording or with your enthusiasm And also have opportunities to see another child who is really suffering and struggling where you can put your full focus on them. You can be a really great ally as any loved one trying to steer conversations away from questions. Um, If if there's a scenario where there's people who don't necessarily know everything that's going on and somebody is asking questions about when somebody is going to have children or telling them they shouldn't wait too long or when they're going to have more children um, or family conversation or in a group setting with friends, there's an ongoing conversation about kids that seems to be taking over um, the dialogue. You can be a great ally by just changing the subject. So it isn't always the person who's suffering that has to leave the room or change the subject, that you can do that on your own without asking them, without checking in to see if they need it, but just saying like, hey, we've been talking about kids a lot now. Let's let's change the subject. Let's talk about work. Let's talk about something else. Um, so that you're sort of a silent ally in that way, shifting the conversation. That can be really helpful. Uh, there's a question, how can I gently encourage them to seek support if needed? That's a sensitive one for sure. Uh, it is very beneficial for people to access uh, mental health supports as they go through this. Um, There's research that shows that people who go through ongoing infertility have similar rates of depression and anxiety as people diagnosed with cancer, with HIV, with heart disease. This is a really big deal. And it's very hard to get through without support. Suggesting somebody get support at the kind of wrong moment could come across as really hurtful as though they're not handling it well. So I I appreciate uh, the question and I appreciate how you said gently encourage. Um, One of the things I would say is not to wait for a crisis. Oftentimes, by the time I see somebody, they've been struggling for a really, really long time. If somebody is letting you know at the beginning that they've been trying and that they're struggling, then you could make the suggestion at that point when it isn't a crisis. Um, A lot of the counselors like myself who do this work It isn't only about mental health supports in terms of what people think of around therapy. It's also psychoeducational. So helping people make decisions, helping to explain what IVF is, helping to set people's expectations for what their future family planning might be, letting them know that there are trained, specialized reproductive counselors who know a lot about how clinics work and know a lot about how these procedures are and how they feel, and that it can be really helpful to talk those things through. Um, So coming at it from a bit of a psychoeducational bend can be really helpful. One of the things that's really lovely about counseling is that for the therapy, therapy part of counseling, is that it's an opportunity for somebody to talk about how they're feeling without worrying about how they're feeling impacts other people. If your adult child is talking to you about their infertility, there's no way that that doesn't cause you pain. And they must know that. And so that's also a way of broaching it, not to say that they're causing you pain, um, but to say that you that you know that it can be really beneficial to have a safe space to just talk about your feelings without worrying about how anybody else thinks about your feelings. It can be helpful to find out if their clinic has counselors that they're affiliated with, TRIO does, um, and being able to say, you know, I've been doing some research on IVF and trying to understand what you're going through. I saw on TRIO's website that they have counselors that they're affiliated with. Um, you know, I wonder if that is something that could be helpful to you. I know you've got good friends and I know you always have us, um, but there's stuff that we don't know. And maybe somebody who works in this field might be able to offer some insight that that we're not able to. Um, those kinds of things can be really helpful. 
ideally that idea of counseling is coming up, not just in a crisis, it's coming up in advance. If you're talking about support, you were talking about counseling support, um, but that also might be true just in terms of reproductive support, reminding them that it's about information and they can still always make whatever decision that they want. Um, but the more support and access that they get to that information as early as possible, the more decisions they're able to make from an informed place. So that can be really helpful as well. Okay, we're seeing if we have any other questions before we wrap up that love. If it's possible to organize an evening without children, that can be a really nice thing. Uh, if your loved one is struggling with secondary infertility, um, being able to look for opportunities to get together with maybe families that have children, but that don't have lots of children, making sure that you're not at leasting people. Uh, so that would be where you tell somebody that at least they already have a child, or at least they know that they can get pregnant, or at least they have the money to pay for IVF. Any possible thing that somebody would think about that is one of those, the person that you love knows that. People are saying that because they want to be helpful and because you have love for the person in your life and you're trying to find ways to be supportive, uh, but that often ends up landing not well uh, because they know those things and it doesn't help ease the pain in their heart. It's okay to acknowledge that, but not as an at least. I know how much you love your son and I can only imagine how much harder it is, um, knowing how much you want another baby to have a sibling for your son. Those kinds of things can be really important to avoid uh, because again, it's about validating how somebody is feeling and letting them know that you're a safe space and that the feelings that they're having are completely normal. And there is a really wide range of those emotions. So knowing what they are can be, people can feel grateful for the child they already have and devastated that they've had a loss. They can feel grateful that they're able to afford IVF and heartbroken that they are in a scenario where that's what they need to do to have a baby. So it's possible to hold multiple emotions at the same time. And that's also a great thing to be able to remind the person that you love about that they don't have to choose between their emotions, that you're here to be able to hold space for any of the emotions that they're having, because you know that this is a really complicated time. We're just at just past 7.30. Uh, and so I'm going to give it another minute or two and see if anybody has any other questions. As we wrap up, I want to, first of all, thank all of you for being here. It is so beautiful and heartwarming to know that you're taking time out of your own schedules to find out how you can better support the people in your life. Infertility and reproductive loss truly is one of the most difficult and misunderstood things that people go through. There are very little supports out there. It is a very, very isolating and lonely experience. And for you to be taking the time to do this is incredibly beautiful. So on their behalf, I just want to thank you so much for this. Um, Trio is going to be following up with uh, a, an email to you. If you would like a copy of this, you're welcome to it. You can just let them know. And as I said, they will be posting it on their website. Uh, for you to be able to access at a later point in time. So thank you again so much. I hope that you have a really good evening and that you're able to take some of the learnings from tonight and really put them into play with the people that you love so that this feels more supportive and loving for them and that you feel like you've got some concrete ways of helping the person that you love who you know is suffering. So thank you so much and good night.